Hey everyone, Nicholas here, and for this week's episode, I'm bringing you something a little different than what you're probably used to hearing and seeing on the Hound on the Run podcast. If you are subscribed to my newsletter or have watched my YouTube videos, you might know that I wrote a book last year called Cat Dog Chronicles. The book is a first-hand retelling of my experience learning how to hunt bobcats with my hounds. Thank you to everyone who has bought the book, read it, and shared your feedback with me. I'm incredibly grateful for all the support I've received. For my busy friends who don't have time to sit down and read, and trust me, I'm right there with you, I'm happy to report that I've recorded the audiobook version of Cat Dog Chronicles, which will be available for purchase on Audible very soon. I wanted to give my podcast listeners the opportunity to hear it first by sharing chapter one here on the podcast. In this introductory chapter, I share how I got started in hound hunting, how I became so captivated by the idea of treeing bobcats with my dogs, and how all of this has added so much adventure and richness to my life. By listening to this chapter, I hope you get to know me a bit more, and I hope it gives you a better idea of what Hound on the Run is all about. Unlike our normal podcast episodes, which are multimedia experiences, this one is pretty much audio only. So sit back, relax, and let my dulcet tones lull you into a vegetative state. If you want to let me know what you think of it, please leave a comment on the video, contact me through the contact page on houndontherun.com, or leave a voicemail at 971-301-4884. That is 971-301-4884. This is Cat Dog Chronicles by Nicholas Isaac. Copyright 2022. Read by the author. Chapter 1. Introduction. Had I known exactly how involved, complicated, and difficult hound hunting would be before it consumed my life, I likely never would have started in the first place. My dogs would have remained mere pets, and all my free time would have been spent chasing something else. What that something else would have been, I do not know. But surely it wouldn't have been as elusive, evasive, cunning, and downright frustrating as a bobcat. I just finished my first full season pursuing bobcats, and as I reflect on what has happened over the last six months, I'm struggling to comprehend everything I've learned about my dogs, the cats we chase, and perhaps most profoundly, myself, who I am as a hunter, a dog owner, and a human being. The amount of time and effort, money and stress, struggle and frustration that goes into the sport of hound hunting blows my mind and I don't think the average person, or even other hunters, heck, even the upland and waterfowl hunters who use dogs, know how truly involved hound hunting is. The common thought, especially among the anti-hunting crowd, is that hunting with hounds is cheating or a shortcut. Well, that has not been my experience. In many ways, it feels like the opposite of cheating, due to the many layers of skill sets involved and the overall life engulfing commitment required. It is not something one can simply go out and do. As I write this, I'm realizing that since bringing my first dog home, I haven't sat still long enough to really think about how I got so wrapped up in all this hound running business to begin with. I'd like to unpack some of my hound hunting origin story before I dive into the meat of what this book is all about, my journey of learning how to catch bobcats with my dogs. A little over four years ago, I got my first dog, Finn, a male Walker Blue Tick Coonhound Cross, who was one and a half years old at the time. I never had any plans of actually hunting with him, even though I had always thought hunting dogs were cool and wanted one of my own at some point in my life. A month or so later, I decided to get him a buddy, Cooley, a female Walker Black and Tan Coonhound Cross, who was a nine-week-old puppy at the time. When I traced my steps back, it was Cooley who truly got me into all of this. While Finn was content to be a couch potato house dog, it was seeing Cooley's insatiable drive and natural tracking abilities come out all on their own that changed everything for me. What started as innocent, playful games of hide and seek in the backyard quickly turned into laying down scent drags with artificial raccoon scent for Cooley and Finn to follow. Finn had been hunting before I got him, coming from a seasoned bobcat hunter, the man who would eventually become my hound mentor, as I like to call him. So I wasn't too surprised that he knew how to track. But to watch Cooley, who I got as a puppy, know how to follow a scent all on her own with no guidance or training was unbelievable to me. It felt like I was watching a magic trick and I couldn't get enough of it. Watching that little black and white dog work her nose ignited something inside me I didn't know was there. I was so excited about these dogs and what they could do that I wanted as much canine action as I could get and saw no other option but to start hunting with them. 
Before getting my first two hounds, I was already deeply in love with hunting, although I had never killed anything at that point. Hunting, for me, was an outgrowth of my previous folly, fishing, and as I was living in Louisiana at the time, my first hunting endeavors were with a bow and arrow hunting white-tailed deer and hogs in the swamps outside Baton Rouge. I grew up shooting with my dad, so I was comfortable with firearms, and I knew how to navigate in the woods well enough to not get completely lost and find my way back to the truck. I had some of the basics covered, I figured, that would make it at least somewhat feasible to start hunting with my dogs. I am, and always have been, a diligent researcher when it comes to my hobbies. Once I decided that I wanted to explore the idea of hunting with my dogs, I quickly took to the internet and made several library visits, reading as much as I could about hunting with hounds. To my surprise, while I did find some information on various hunting forums, there wasn't much online that would help someone like me get into hound hunting, starting with no experience at all. For example, if a person wants to get into, say, fly fishing for trout, there are hundreds if not thousands of websites that give step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it, outlining all the gear one needs, all the techniques to use, and where to go. That is simply not the case with hound hunting. You have to dig and dig and dig. Perhaps more importantly, and more of a challenge, is that you must know what to search for and what questions to ask in the first place. As a total newbie, I had no idea what questions I should be asking, and as such, the learning curve felt impossibly steep. I did, however, find some good books at the library that gave me more or less a general overview of hunting with dogs, but overall I felt quite helpless and without direction. Still, I did not let that stop me from accepting the challenge of pursuing wild animals with my coon hounds. My first exposure to cat dogs. Before I go on, I need to back up and mention how I ended up with Finn in the first place and the events that led up to me bringing him home. Through almost pure happenstance, I was invited by my stepdad, a tattoo artist, to tag along on a bobcat hunt with one of his clients. I was thrilled by the idea and accepted the invitation immediately. A few weeks later, I was squeezed into the back seat of an extra cab Tacoma with a huge dog box in the back filled with a dozen or so hounds. Going deep into the Coast Range Mountains of Oregon, we watched in amazement all day as our host and his hounds scoured the woods looking for a cat. He, like an army general, his hounds like cat-seeking missiles. Most of the day was spent in the truck, driving down every back road and every spur, but it ended with a mile-long hike through some of the steepest terrain I'd ever been on to find his whole pack at the base of a 15-story spruce tree, baying their hearts out at the bobcat perched some 80 feet up. The bellowing echoes ringing off the canyon walls and permeating the dense, fog-laden atmosphere is a sound I will never forget until the day I die. We left the cat in the tree to run another day and marched back to the truck with his dogs unleashed, all together high from the experience. On the drive out of the woods, I could not stop talking about how incredible it was to see his dogs work, and my questions for our host never stopped. I asked him about all of his dogs, what breed they were, and why he had those specific dogs. He described them simply as walkers, and he had them because they catch bobcats. He went into much more depth than that, but at the time I had no basis for understanding what he was talking about, so nearly all the terms he was using and concepts he was explaining went right over my head. One of his dogs, a female named Apache, particularly caught my eye, and I couldn't look at her without smiling. His only blue tick in the pack, Apache, was one of his older dogs, and her little waddle-like run cracked me up. I saw her as an old queen. At one point on the drive back to his house, I mentioned that my wife and I had been talking about getting a dog, and that I was looking into different breeds of hunting dogs, but wasn't sure what I wanted to get. You can have Apache's son if you want, he said. Are you serious? I replied, almost confused by how quickly he offered, having just met me for the first time that morning. Dead serious, he said. You'll meet him when we get back to the house. Seriously, if you want him, he's all yours. Now, keep in mind, this man had no idea I had any interest in hound hunting at the time. And to be honest, I didn't know that I did either. But still, it felt like an ask and you shall receive kind of moment and almost seemed too good to be true. That night, back at home, I mentioned it to my wife and it caught her by surprise too. We had been talking about getting a dog and looking online at various adoption sites with their exorbitant rehoming fees, but hadn't yet made any plans to actually pursue that. But a month later, I got a text from an unfamiliar number that read, come get your dog. So I did, and the rest is history. It all starts with raccoons. Before going on that first bobcat hunt, 
Most of what I knew about hunting with hounds was that it was illegal to use dogs to pursue and hunt cougar and bear in my home state of Oregon. Based on that, which is more or less common knowledge to anyone who's ever picked up a hunting regulations book in the state, I assumed, based on that, which is more or less common knowledge to anyone who's ever picked up a hunting regulations book in the state, that people didn't hunt with hounds at all. I had no idea that hounds were used to treat bobcats. And if I'm being honest, I had never even thought about the fact that there were bobcats in Oregon. It was a detail that had no bearing in my life at the time. I did, however, know that there were plenty of raccoons in Oregon because, well, raccoons are everywhere, and I had seen them rummaging through trash in our neighborhood and roadkilled all over the place. You never see a roadkilled bobcat. I knew coon hunting was a thing in Louisiana, and Where the Red Fern Grows had always been a favorite book of mine, but still, I did not know to what extent raccoons were hunted with dogs in Oregon. Everything hound hunting related in Oregon is buried multiple layers deep, and this holds true for the hunting regulations surrounding the sport. It took me a while to figure out that the regulations concerning hound hunting are not found in the main hunting regulations book, but were an entirely different set of fur bearer regulations, the same literature where the trapping regulations are found. At that point, the decision to start hunting with my dogs was made, and raccoons were the obvious target. I saw what was involved in hunting bobcats and it was clear I did not have what it would take in almost every way. First, I only had a two-wheel drive truck at the time, which was not nearly suitable for the steep, slippery back roads. I didn't know where to go, nor what type of terrain and habitat in which bobcats lived. And I definitely didn't have any of the knowledge required to train dogs to strike, track, trail, and tree bobcats. The limited information I found while researching made it clear that raccoons were much more accessible and were where I needed to start. I learned in the fur bear regulations that raccoons could be pursued, meaning chased and treed by dogs, but not killed, from September 1st through March 15th, and could be harvested, meaning killed, from December 1st through March 15th with no bag limit. Having only participated in big game hunting at that point, where the seasons are usually quite short and limited, I was surprised by how long the season was. What's more, Hunting at night is completely legal, and the hunting license for fur bearers only costs about $25. Up to speed on the regulations and with the correct license acquired, I took my dogs on our first coon hunt on a cold night in December 2018. I had worked my dogs on many scent drags by then, but I still had no expectations of whether or not they could do the real thing. To my astonishment, at a mere eight months old, Cooley treed her first raccoon all by herself. I knew she did it all by herself because Finn was over 350 yards away doing something else entirely, most likely chasing a deer. I shot the ringtail out to her and it has been game on ever since. I spent that season and the next hunting only raccoons with my dogs. I quickly became addicted to the sport and spent as many nights as I could out following my dogs with a headlamp, bashing my way through the thickest, nastiest, most blackberry choked creek bottoms around. Although I knew there were plenty of raccoons around, I was shocked to discover how difficult it is to find land to hunt them on. While there is a lot of publicly accessible land to hunt in Oregon, most of that is up in the mountains where there may be some raccoons here and there, but their numbers aren't as high nor as concentrated as in the lower elevation farmlands of the Willamette Valley. As a longtime map fanatic, I did manage to find a few places in the valley that held raccoons and spent nearly all my time there. Sometime in 2019, I made a friend at work who also coon hunted and who happened to have permission to hunt a handful of farms between 45 minutes and an hour away. The farmers, most growing either blueberries or hazelnuts, wanted all the raccoons gone due to crop damage. So we were welcome guests and these opportunities helped me get my dogs on many raccoons. Coon hunting gave me my foundation for hunting with my dogs and looking back, it was the perfect place for us to start. But after a while, thoughts started creeping into my mind about exploring other species to pursue. I kept going back to that first bobcat hunt I went on, and scenes from that day would pop into my head and play over and over. It was like I was in disbelief of what I had seen. I couldn't believe that whole sequence of events was real. The more nights I hunted and the more competent I became as a handler, the more I understood what was happening behind the scenes with that guy, his pack of walkers, and the 20-some pound cat they were after. Having experienced firsthand what it's like to turn a dog loose, to have it end up at a tree with your target quarry in it, I had begun to develop eyes to see what he made look incredibly easy was in reality extremely difficult. Foolishly, I decided that I, too, would attempt to catch bobcats with my dogs. I wanted to do it all.
During the 2019-2020 hunting season, my plan was to keep hunting raccoons at night, but then also go out during the day to hunt bobcats. I had completely given up on fishing at that point, but I also wanted to continue hunting deer and elk to try to get some meat in the freezer. On top of all that, I was trying to get my newsletter and podcast, Hound on the Run, off the ground as a way to document and share all the adventures I was going on and the things I was learning. But I soon realized that there are only so many hours in a day, only so much extra money in the bank for hunting licenses, tags, gas, and gear, and that some amount of sleep is necessary. Thank goodness my wife is incredibly patient and highly supportive of my passions. A less fortunate man with a less understanding wife would surely be divorced by now. Looking back now, I'm almost too embarrassed to write about my early days trying to hunt bobcats with my dogs. I was so naive. It's painful to think about. Even though it wasn't that long ago I started, it feels like I've lived a thousand lives since then. To say I learned many lessons is an understatement, and is why I've decided to write this book. I need to unpack all the knowledge I've acquired over the last few years with my dogs, and as a writer, the best way for me to do that is by putting it all down on the page. Unpacking everything I've learned. One of the most profound things I've learned through hound hunting is the value of a good mentor. Details about who my mentor is and how he has helped me in so many ways will unfurl as I go deeper into my story of hound hunting. But something he has repeated to me over and over is that to successfully catch bobcats, it's 99% up to the hunter and only 1% up to the dogs. I still don't know if I fully understand what he means. I've learned that to catch bobcats, you have to hunt where bobcats exist. This has been one of the steepest hills to climb in terms of my hound hunting education, and while I have had many revelations about bobcat habitat and how bobcats use certain types of terrain at different times of year, it still feels like I'm largely guessing about where I might find these little wild cats. Something that held me back tremendously from getting into bobcat hunting came down to transportation and being able to travel and navigate in the terrain where bobcats exist. Across the country, there are many different ways and styles in which hunters move around with their dogs to catch game. In the deserts of the southwest, mules or horses are the sensible choice. In places like Montana or Wyoming, where most hunting is done in deep snow, snowmobiles are the obvious option. When coon hunting almost anywhere, a good pair of briar-proof hip boots is all you really need. But here in Oregon, where most of our bobcat hunting is done in the mountains on bare ground, meaning no snow, either on public land or accessible private timberland, a high-clearance four-wheel drive truck equipped with a dog box with a rail is the vehicle of choice. Like I mentioned before, I started with a two-wheel drive Ford F-150, then made some painfully embarrassing and foolish vehicle-related choices before acquiring my current hunting rig. I'll tell you more about my previous hound wagon, as I'm sure you'll find it entertaining. But there's more to getting around in the woods than simply having the right truck. What happens when a tree falls across the road? What happens when the starter in your truck dies? How about the alternator? What about when you run out of gas? How do you know what roads are safe and legal to drive on? What will you do if they lock the gate before you can drive out? These and more were some of the many ungoogleable skills I had to learn in real time. Then there are the dogs. Reading and deciphering a dog's body language and what it's doing with its voice is one of the most complex yet enjoyable aspects of hound hunting for me. When I get home from a day in the woods, I'll often spend hours lying awake at night, replaying scenes from the hunt, watching Whiskey on the box in the rearview mirror as she strikes, observing the subtle differences in her tail movements when she sniffs one of those small pine tree saplings bobcats like to spray on, how she runs at times with her nose to the ground snorting like a pig, and others with her head in the air assessing the wind at a full tilt run. Since the first days and weeks of owning Finn and Cooley, I have taken dog training very seriously. In those early days, I was more focused on obedience-related training tasks. Sit, heal, come when called, laying in place, etc. When I was only coon hunting with them, the main training tasks were related to long-distance recall and teaching them that chasing deer is bad. But once I started taking them to the mountains to run bobcats, the level of training required and all its subtleties almost broke my brain. This is where having a great mentor has become invaluable. Things like backtracking, barking out of place, going the wrong direction on tracks were things I didn't even know I needed to recognize and correct because I didn't know any of that was a thing. For me, this aspect of hunting dog training will always be a work in progress. Hound hunting is humbling in a thousand different ways, and I'm still not certain I'll ever have what it really takes to be a consistently successful bobcat hunter. 
Much of this, I feel, comes down to not my skill sets and ability to learn, but more so my overall life circumstances. In the book, Bobcat Dog by David Pegtall, he describes the different levels of bobcat hunters, with the highest level being someone who has practically unlimited income and unlimited time. I, unfortunately, am at the lowest level he describes and would be considered more or less a weekend warrior. I'm not mad about it, but it has been a humbling experience to come to this realization. My mentor, however, does fall into the higher levels of houndsmen and as such has served as a glowing example of what's possible. While I've struggled to accept my current status, I find great inspiration in knowing that it is possible to achieve these higher levels and striving to climb that ladder has become a driving force in my life to propel myself forward as a man and as a provider for my family. One thing I've learned about myself as I've gone deeper and deeper into hound hunting is that there isn't a single goal or end point I'm trying to achieve. I've fallen in love with the process and lifestyle of owning hounds, and it's the adventure of it all that drives me to keep loading up the dogs and putting thousands of miles on my truck. I'm not in this purely for the sake of catching bobcats. I guess that's the reason on paper why I go to the woods, but not what keeps me coming back time after time. To many of my fellow hunters, that might not make a lot of sense, or it might make a lot of sense to some. I do not know, but that's what I want to explore in this book by sharing some stories and lessons learned from my past hunting season learning how to catch bobcats with my dogs. I hope you enjoy.